This hearing will come to order. Apologies for beginning a little bit late. We have a vote ongoing. We're going to have another at about 5.30. But um, I want to thank the four individuals or witnesses today for being with us. And uh, thank as well my uh, friend, Senator Johnson, as ranking member for his cooperation and his support in moving forward with this hearing. Uh, a lot going on of historic magnitude before the United States Senate, but the issue before us today is truly of historic consequence in precedential and uh, practical import. The issue is, in fact, uh, whether four companies sitting here today, represented by very able leadership, accept their obligation to respond to congressional subpoenas. Their apparent refusal to do so in full is not only unprecedented, but it threatens opening a door to other United States companies cloaking themselves from scrutiny whenever they work for a foreign government or even a foreign state-owned enterprise. This potential shield invoked by these four consultants risks blocking not only this subcommittee, but all of Congress from obtaining information needed to do our job. This subcommittee has long engaged in investigations into United States companies and foreign entities. It has engaged in negotiations over the scope of responsive materials. It has received documents and ensured their confidentiality, but it has never, ever conceded to a blanket sweeping claim of foreign sovereign immunity over commercial documents in the possession of an American company. It may seem like a technical issue to you, but it is of critical historic consequence to the United States Congress in doing its job. It's simply staggering to me that American companies are not only willing to accept this claim, allowing the Saudi government to determine what is permitted to provide this subcommittee, but also that they would use it to justify their refusal to comply with a duly issued congressional subpoena. A congressional subpoena is not a request. It carries the full weight of the law. The failure to respond to it carries with it serious consequences. It's even more staggering that, the, that Saudi Arabia is threatening employees of your companies with imprisonment if the documents we're seeking are not produced. Staggering to me. Outrageous. Perhaps we shouldn't be surprised. We began this inquiry last summer because of our concerns that Saudi Arabia, a country with an abhorrent human rights record, was trying to take over American golf and use that institution to sports wash its own public image. Saudi Arabia and its advocates argue that we should believe that they are turning over a new leaf, beginning a new chapter. But we are presented with another example of extreme and deceitful conduct. To the United States public and the United States government, Saudi Arabia claims that these are just innocuous commercial investments, including investments in sports. But in its own courts, it argues that it's classified material pertaining to state national security interests. It simply can't have it both ways. We are seeking United States documents from United States companies about United States investments, US-focused strategies, and United States institutions. Allowing these companies to ignore their obligation to respond to US law is not just an affront to the subcommittee at risk creating a dangerous precedent that would allow companies to effectively contract away their obligations to other countries all around the world where you do business, where you perform services, 
to comply with United States law. Although the subcommittee's inquiry began last summer with questions about the Saudi Arabian Public Investment Fund or the, the PIFs, billion dollar investment in US golf, it has become much bigger and more consequential. After McKinsey, BCG, Teneo, and M. Klein each refused to voluntarily produce records about their work for the PIF because of the Saudi Arabia objections, we issued subpoenas compelling them to do so. Our goal is simple. We want to determine what work these companies have done and are doing that allows a foreign authoritarian <coughs> government to use instruments of commerce in the United States to increase its influence within our shores and rebrand its tarnished image after years of horrific human rights abuses. Our subpoenas seek documents that will illustrate how these four companies have assisted the PIF in increasing investments and exerting its influence in the United States. Our purpose is to understand the scope of services they have provided, including, but not limited to, how they intend to use these investments in United States entities and institutions, like the PGA Tour and other sports, to increase their access. We intend to use the findings of today's inquiry to consider whether our laws surrounding the disclosure of foreign entanglements need to be strengthened. Our preliminary findings certainly suggest that we need stronger protections of American interests when it comes to foreign entities. Just days before the original deadline to produce documents under the subpoenas, we learned from each of the consultants that the PIF had filed lawsuits in Saudi administrative court to block them from producing these documents to us. We were surprised to learn that the PIF had taken the unprecedented step of asserting that the records requested by this subcommittee are, quote, classified as confidential, end quote, and that production of these records to Congress could allegedly, quote, harm the national security interests, policies, or rights of Saudi Arabia and pose a, quote, imminent threat to the kingdom's sovereignty, end quote. The PIF's claims of threats to Saudi Arabian sovereignty and the Saudi, Saudi court order raised our alarm and added to the urgency of this investigation. How is it that consulting work performed by American companies, including records about investment in United States golf, could harm Saudi Arabia's national security? How can allegedly commercial investments directed at the United States be out of the reach of subpoena issued by the United States government? The fact that we have to ask these questions heightens our concern about their work, not only for Saudi Arabia, but for other regimes around the world, many of them authoritarian governments. The companies sitting before us today have told us that they are concerned that they or their Saudi-based employees will be imprisoned in Saudi Arabia if they comply with our subpoenas. And to this, I would say, and I say it to Saudi Arabia, I know you're watching, no one anywhere in the world should be arrested, imprisoned, or otherwise harmed because an American company has complied with American law. And we will be watching what the reaction is, assuming that you decide to do the right thing and comply with American law. Our nation has a long history of welcoming foreign investment, and I want the Saudi investments in the United States to continue. We, we also have a long history of transparency and compliance and adherence to the rule of law. Doing business in America requires compliance with American law. And we are not about to sell our legal system to the highest bigger bidder or the biggest bully. I know that Saudi Arabia wants to be a serious player on the world stage. I believe it can have a constructive role. I truly believe it can have 
a very positive impact in the widening crisis in the Middle East, and I hope it will. And I have visited Saudi Arabia, and I'm convinced of its good faith determination to play that role. But threats to U.S. companies and interference with congressional oversight are simply not consistent with those goals. The PIF is not here today, but its U.S.-based consultants are. While the PIF's conduct is troubling, their consultants bear responsibility too. You have option, opted to sign contracts governed by foreign laws. You have chosen to put offices in Saudi Arabia where your employees may be imprisoned under its supposed legal system. You have chosen to accept what I suspect amounts to millions, if not billions of dollars in the face of a harrowing record of human rights abuses by your business partners in Saudi Arabia, and at least one instance accused of being of playing a role in those abuses. And even though you have documents that we are seeking, you continue to refuse to comply with our subpoenas unless explicitly authorized by the PIF. Let me be clear, a series of choices got you to this point, and you have decisions to make. The ramifications for today's hearing have the potential to echo far outside this chamber. This subcommittee will consider all of your valid legal defenses. I respect your right to make them, but contracting with a foreign entity is not one of them. We are not about to allow a precedent that would make a foreign contract a defense to complying with a duly authorized subpoena. Saudi Arabia is welcome, and we do welcome, their investment in the United States. If they invest in our enterprises and they take advantage of our economic system, and they have the protection of our rule of law, the rights under United States law, they can't simply pick and choose the laws they're going to obey. With that, I turn to the ranking member. Hey, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Since the start of the subcommittee's investigation into the framework agreement between the PGA Tour and the Saudi Arabian Public Investment Fund, the PIF, I've been concerned that our intrusion into delicate negotiations could make it even more difficult for professional golf to create a structure that would allow the best players to regularly compete against each other at the highest level. Fortunately, we have not had a public hearing on this subject since last September, allowing the PGA Tour to pursue this goal with minimal interference. It now appears some progress has been made. Last Wednesday, the PGA announced that it was partnering with Strategic Sports Group, which will invest up to $3 billion into a new commercial venture under the PGA Tour's control. But divisions between the PGA Tour and LIV Golf remain, and discussions between the two entities are still ongoing. Some public reports indicate that a final agreement could occur before the Masters Tournament in April, while other reports indicate that a deal is currently, quote, on life support, unquote. Until a formal decision is reached between the two parties, I remain concerned that any congressional oversight of the matter may do more harm than good. That said, as ranking member, I not only acknowledge, but I must also defend the subcommittee's constitutional authority to investigate a broad range of issues and entities. Using that authority, Chairman Blumenthal chose to continue the subcommittee's inquiry into the PIF and its U.S. business dealings. PSI sent information requests to the PIF, subpoenas the PIF, subpoenaed the PIF's U.S. subsidiary, USSA International LLC, and eventually subpoenaed the PIF's four U.S.-based consultants following the subcommittee's attempts to obtain records voluntarily. Unfortunately, due to Saudi Arabian claims of sovereign immunity and Saudi court rulings, the consultants have been constrained in what documents they believe they can provide. It is my understanding that all four firms here today are facing litigation instigated by the PIF in Saudi court. The firms claim that by producing certain records to the subcommittee, their employees would be in violation of Saudi law and could face severe consequences. That is a very serious reality the subcommittee must consider as it proceeds with this inquiry. I do have sympathy for the position the consultants find themselves in, 
but I have no sympathy for the Saudi claims of sovereign immunity in this inquiry. Any foreign entity wishing to do business in the U.S. must comply with U.S. law and be responsive to congressional subpoenas. That is why I chose to join Chairman Blumenthal in follow-up letters to the consultants calling for full compliance with the subcommittee subpoenas. To be clear, conducting oversight of the PIF is not my top priority, but I am supportive of preserving PSI's oversight prerogatives and responsibilities. PSI is the Senate's chief investigative body, which is why it is armed with the power to compel the production of records. If PSI's ability to access records weakens, then the power of this subcommittee will be reduced and congressional oversight will atrophy further. As a result, Mr. Chairman, I join you on your follow-up letters to these consultants and the PIP because I believe in defending PSI's authorities and access to records. I hope you will similarly support my efforts to obtain records that PSI is entitled to receive. Toward the end of last year, I sent you two letters totaling 30 pages detailing the Department of Health and Human Services failure to respond to my oversight requests on the origins of COVID-19 and the development, distribution, and safety of the COVID-19 vaccines. I ask that you subpoena HHS records and information contained in my more than 50 outstanding requests, including 50 specific pages of Dr. Fauci's records and the empirical Bayesian analysis of Veyer's data that HHS uses as a surveillance tool to, access the, to assess the safety of COVID-19 vaccines. Some of these outstanding requests are nearly three years old. Let me pause and just let that sink in. Prior to getting the emergency use authorization for the vaccine in December, the CDC and FDA held a video conference where they were touting the, you know, the, the f benefits of their VAERS, their vaccine adverse event surveillance system. They were saying, you know, they were going to take adverse events so seriously, if they found somebody that reported a couple days lost work, they're going to get on the phone, they're going to follow up. That was total and complete BS. Early in the year of 2021, those agencies uh, produced a standard operating procedure where they described the analysis, proportional uh, reporting ratios or empirical Bayesian analysis on the VAERS system. Uh, they then denied that they'd produced those analyses, later recanted that and said, well, in fact, they did. I've been requesting now for well over a year that analysis. I mean, we pay for the salaries of these individuals working in these agencies. We pay for these agencies. They publish these standing operating procedures. They're going to do these, saying they're going to do these analyses. They do the analyses, and they will not turn them over to my oversight request, which means they are keeping them hidden from the American public. This subcommittee cannot allow taxpayer-funded agencies to obstruct congressional oversight intended to obtain information that every American has the right to see. I hope you will join me as I have joined you in defending PSI's oversight prerogatives and together demanding full compliance with the subcommittee's requests. I thank the witnesses for complying with the bipartisan request to appear at today's hearing. I look forward to your testimony. Thanks, Senator Johnson. Let me just assure you that uh, I totally respect the minority's responsibility and right to do this kind of oversight. I am prepared to take steps beginning with strong communication to HHS that it has to comply with your oversight requests, and I'm committed to work with you on moving forward. We'll, we'll draft some letters. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, let me introduce the witnesses. Rich Lesser is the global chair of Boston Consulting Group, a consulting company based in Boston, Massachusetts employing more than 30,000 people in offices around the globe. Bob Sternfels is the global managing partner of McKinsey, a consulting firm that is headquartered in New York City and has offices in more than 60 countries and employs more than 30,000 people. Michael Klein is the leader of M. Klein & Company, a global strategic advising company, which is based in New York. Paul Cleary of Teneo, is the Chief Executive Officer of Teneo Strategy, a global public relations and advisory firm, which is headquartered in New York City. Uh, as is our custom, I ask the witnesses to stand and be sworn in. Do you 
swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you. Uh, we'll begin with your testimony, Mr. Lesser. Chairman Blumenthal, Ranking Member Johnson, and distinguished members of this subcommittee. My name is Rich Lesser. I'm the Global Chair of Boston Consulting Group, or as we refer to it, BCG. I joined BCG in 1988. I was chair for North and South America from 2009 to 2012, and CEO of BCG from 2013 to 2021. I appear before you today proud to represent BCG. All 33,000 colleagues across 50 countries and more than 100 offices, including 25 in the United States. We strive to take on the hardest problems and create enormous value for our clients while living our purpose and our values every day. BCG's work in the public sector, including with governments and government-owned entities, is guided by a mission to improve the financial, economic, and societal well-being of the countries in which we operate and for their citizens. In all our work, we apply consistent standards that dictate who we will work with and on what topics. BCG opened its first office in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia when I was CEO in 2015. Our office there is now home to 260 BCGers of 28 nationalities, including American citizens. Women make up nearly 40% of our consulting team and approximately 50% of our overall staff. Saudi Arabia is a long-standing U.S. ally. It has undertaken important efforts to diversify its economy and is per pursuing social and cultural reforms, improving education, developing infrastructure, and more. Saudi Arabia's Public Investment Fund, or the PIF, has been an important part of the kingdom's economic development and diversification. Over the years, BCG has contributed to these efforts. For example, helping on Saudi Arabia's labor market reforms, including increasing women's participation in the workforce. Furthermore, we have supported Saudi in, in defining unemployment and training programs and upskilling young Saudi Arabians. We have also worked on advancing the education system and infrastructure development. BCG is now caught between two sovereigns. The subcommittee requested that we provide information related to work we have done for the PIF. The PIF has told us that it considers that information to be protected government information. Like other countries, Saudi Arabia has laws protecting that type of information and applies serious criminal penalties on those who disclose it without permission. We risk criminal and financial penalties for the firm and for individuals working or living in Saudi Arabia. In support of its position, the PIF initiated litigation against BCG in Saudi court, and we have challenged the PIF's position. BCG is complying with the subpoena and making productions to the subcommittee within the legal constraints that we are subject to. We've engaged with leaders at all levels of the PIF in our continued efforts to make a robust production as possible to as most, make a robust a production as possible to the subcommittee. I also want to reassure you that our work for the PIF is consistent with the work we do for commercial investors and other sovereign wealth funds. We advise on fund strategy and investments, operating models, and value creation opportunities. We also advise clients on how to accelerate the success of their portfolio companies. I also want to be clear on the work we have not done. We have not worked for the PIF on Live Golf. We have not worked for the PIF on its investments in sports in the United States. We have not worked for the PIF on its direct investments in US companies other than Uber and Magic Leap as we shared with the subcommittee last week. And we have not supported the PIF on any US lobbying efforts. We are committed to finding a solution to this challenging situation that satisfies all parties involved and does not put our firm or our people at risk of serious criminal prosecution. We are hopeful that this subcommittee and the PIF continue their dialogue 
and resolve these issues as quickly as possible. BCG has immense respect for this subcommittee's important work and desires to cooperate with your inquiry. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thanks, Mr. Lesser. Uh, Mr. Schoenfeld. Chairman Blumenthal, uh, Ranking Member Johnson, members of the subcommittee, uh, I'm Bob Sternfels, and I'm the Global Managing Partner for McKinsey & Company, where I've worked for over 30 years. I want to say at the outset, we treat this process very seriously, and I'm here to provide as much information as I can. McKinsey & Company is, a, is one of the leading providers of business consulting services. We were founded in Chicago in 1926. And today, we have more than 45,000 employees across 65 countries, with more than 14,000 employees here in the United States. We're an American company with American values, proudly serving clients around the globe. We seek to comply with the laws in every location in which we operate. But we also go beyond what is required by having what we, what we believe to be the industry's most comprehensive and rigorous client selection policy, which takes into account both the content of the work and the country in which the work is performed. What this means in practice is we do a thorough risk assessment of every client engagement we take on. Turning to the Middle East, McKinsey opened its office in Saudi Arabia in 2010 in recognition that the Saudi economy is part of a rapidly changing and important region. Given our rigorous client selection policy, our work with clients in Saudi focuses solely in areas such as education, housing, diversifying the economy, energy transition, healthcare, and expanding opportunities to small and medium-sized enterprise. Our clients also include many U.S. and multinational companies that work and invest in Saudi Arabia. Now, one of the clients we serve in Saudi Arabia is the Public Investment Fund. Our work with the PIF is just like the work we do with clients uh, every day around the world. We support them on a range of topics, including business case analysis, organizational matters, and other operational issues. The vast majority of our work with the PIF is related to investments and activities in Saudi Arabia, not in the United States. In fact, there were only three global engagements where we identified some link to the US. And to my knowledge, none of those yielded any investment in the United States. An area the subcommittee expressed as a priority to us was golf. Our support on the topic of golf was limited and occurred in 2021. Our work looked at the potential revenues for a new golf tour and what would make such a tour economically viable. We also analyzed ways to structure a new golf tour, including organizational and staffing models. McKinsey did not assess the strategic viability of a new tour, nor did we advocate or advance the interests of the tour with any external audience. Our work predated the launch of Live Golf and was well before the PGA Tour's proposed merger with Live Golf. As I have previously stated, we take this subcommittee's authority extremely seriously. Since first learning of the subcommittee's interest, we've worked to provide you with documents, starting with what we understood to be your key priorities. To date, we've produced more than 4,300 pages of documents, including your express priority of all four of the final deliverables that we've prepared on golf, as well as the relevant contracts, interim project materials, and the request for proposal from the PIF. These materials demonstrate the scope and content of our work on golf, which was primarily a business case analysis for a new golf tour. Now, shortly after receiving the subcommittee subpoena, a Saudi court issued an injunction prohibiting the disclosure of our materials. We've opposed that injunction and continue to do so vigorously. This includes disputing any claim that our employees are public officials under Saudi law. This is very serious to me because from what I understand, the violation of Saudi law can result in civil and criminal penalties. So this has put us in a difficult position. Frankly, we're between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, we're contesting this ruling in Saudi Arabia. On the other, we're also in constant discussions to find a way to provide you with more information in a manner that's respectful of our clients' concerns about competitively sensitive information. We remain focused on complying with this subpoena and ensuring the well-being of more than 400 colleagues based in Saudi Arabia, nine of whom are Americans. We fully recognize that this has been frustrating for the committee and it's also been difficult for us. We made progress in providing documents and removing redactions, including recently as yesterday. And I give you my commitment, we're not done with this effort. We will continue to work with the subcommittee after today's hearing. Thank you for the invitation to be here, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thanks, Mr. Sternfels. Mr. Klein. Chairman Blumenthal, Ranking Member Johnson, members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. 
I have immense respect I think for the United States. Your mic it may not be on. You want to press that button right in front of the. It says talk. There we go. I have immense respect for the United States Senate and for this committee, and I'm committed to answering your questions to the best of my ability. My name is Michael Klein, and I have worked as an investment banker for approximately 35 years. I lead M. Klein & Company, a financial advisory and investment banking firm based in New York City. I am proud of the work our team has done to support some of the most respected American companies and investors in the American economy. I'm also proud of the work we do for the communities that we serve. Because of our small size, we focus only on financial advisory services for a limited number of clients and consequential transactions. And we hold ourselves to the highest professional standards in all of our engagements, both in regard to our home U.S. market and where our clients reside. You've invited me here today to discuss our response to a subpoena about the U.S. investments made by the Public Investment Fund. We have sought to comply with the committee's requests and we will continue to do so. I believe there is a great deal that we will agree on today and I'm hopeful that we can discuss that in full. One of the issues that I understand has been central to the committee is the potential investment partnership between the PGA Tour and the PIF. As you know, the PGA Tour has recently announced a transaction establishing a commercial entity controlled by the tour with a stated goal to grow the tour through an investment of in excess of $1.5 billion from a group of American sports investors not affiliated with the PIF. The tour has stated publicly that negotiations with the PIF are ongoing and that any investment by the PIF will be subject to appropriate regulatory approvals. This is consistent with the framework agreement struck in June 2023 to unify and grow the game of golf between the PIF and the PGA. One of the things I believe we agree on is that markets should be fair and transparent to all participants. The United States, as the most advanced market in the world, has robust regulatory processes to ensure just this. Our firm believes in these processes and we fully participate in them. We have provided a substantial collection of materials reflecting a good faith effort to produce responsive information. We understand that you would like more and we are working to provide even more documents through ongoing reviews with the PIF and through our own specific direct application to the courts. But as the committee is aware, I am appearing today under significant legal constraints outside of our direct control. Last November, our company and the others here today were sued by the PIF in Saudi Arabia to prevent us from submitting certain information to the committee. We have formally been enjoined by the court. We have challenged this injunction so that we can comply fully with the committee. Although we hope that the case will be resolved in the future and there are hearings scheduled for just next month, the outstanding court orders expose me and my employees to not just civil liability, but criminal penalties, including potential imprisonment. As I hope the committee can understand, that is simply not a risk I can take for myself or for my employees. Our ability to respond today in full does not reflect any lack of willingness, nor does it reflect any concern regarding the work we've done. We are proud of the work we've done. We are simply limited by the ongoing litigation. Despite the lawsuit, our intention remains to comply and comply fully. In fact, we cleared substantial additional materials for the committee late last week. We expect ongoing additional productions in the near future. The reality of being caught between two legal orders from two sovereign nations is challenging, and it's not one that I have faced before. But please know, I sit here in front of you as a proud American. I am a New Yorker. I am someone who has built a business, attracted capital to the United States, 
and helped create U.S. jobs. I have been able to do this because of what is possible in this country. I'm grateful for that opportunity, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here with you today. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Mr. Klein. Mr. Kerry. Chairman Blumenthal, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Paul Keary, and I am a co-founder and CEO of Teneo. I want to be clear from the start, we value congressional oversight. We understand that it is vital to the legislative process, and we respect the important work of the subcommittee. Toward that end, I would like to address three areas today. First, I want to introduce our firm and explain the type of work we do for our clients in the US and around the world. Second, uh, to provide some more information regarding one of our many clients, the Public Investment Fund, or PIF. And finally, I want to provide some important details about our ongoing good faith efforts to continue providing information and documents to the subcommittee. We have been and remain committed to cooperating and we fully intend to comply with the subcommittee subpoena. I'll start by introducing Teneo. We are a global advisory firm based in the US, headquartered in New York City. We have nearly 1,700 employees in more than 40 offices around the world, and we are very fortunate to advise many of the world's largest companies across nearly every industry. We operate at the highest level of ethics and integrity and a deep commitment to doing right by our clients, our employees, and our stakeholders. Our firm operates across five business segments. Our strategy and communications business advises companies on engagement strategies to help companies build relationships with their stakeholders. We have a leading financial advisory business engaged in restructuring and insolvency matters, a management consulting business that helps companies develop and execute growth strategies, a risk advisory business that helps companies navigate geopolitical, cyber, and other security challenges, and an executive recruitment business. All of these services focus on helping our clients achieve their strategic, operational, and financial objectives. Uh, next, I would like to particularly address Teneo's work with PIF, which is one of our more than 1,200 clients. Over the course of the last several years, we have worked with PIF on strategic communications efforts, helping them convey their investment philosophy and business approach, both in the US and globally. PIF is the economic engine driving Saudi Arabia's transformation, moving the country forward and modernizing its society as part of the country's Vision 2030 strategy. We are proud to play a small, constructive role in promoting those efforts. Since our work for PIF began, we have been open and transparent about our engagements in 2021, we registered for PIF under FARA and have disclosed the details of our work, our fees and expenses and subsequent semi-annual reports to the Justice Department. We have also filed each of our covered contracts with PIF and have registered those individuals working on PIF matters. All of this has been publicly disclosed. We know that PIF's potential investment in professional golf in the US is of particular interest to the subcommittee. We were engaged by PIF on their initial consideration of a possible investment in golf. We helped evaluate this opportunity and advised on potential communication strategies if an investment went forward. I would note we have never represented Live Golf. Tanea was re-engaged by PIF at the beginning of June 2023 to help manage communications with key PIF stakeholders. As to the subcommittee's interest in this matter, it is important to reiterate today I was a proud American company with great respect for this institution, this subcommittee, and US law. We have been committed to cooperating with your inquiry from the start, and we have devoted extensive resources to identify and provide materials responsive to the subcommittee's requests. We have made eight submissions to PSI to date, consisting of over 4,600 pages, and we will keep providing further documents as quickly as possible. We've also provided thousands of additional relevant documents to PIF for their review, as our contracts require, and we await further authorization. I do know you have been frustrated by the pace of production, and I understand that frustration. 
I believe you also know that Teneo, like the other consultants here, is in a very challenging situation as a Saudi court has issued an order directing us for now not to produce documents under review by PIF. Despite these legal challenges, we are firmly committed to finding a path forward in which we continue to work cooperatively and in good faith with the subcommittee and PIF to meet your oversight interests. Again, I'm very proud of the work Teneo does here in the US and globally, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Curie. Uh, just so my colleagues will understand, I welcome and express gratitude for your testimony, but the position that I've heard expressed today is essentially that you will comply with the subpoena, but only and solely so far as Saudi Arabia allows you to do so, which is not compliance with the subpoena. You say that you're between a rock and a hard place, but you've chosen sides. You've chosen the Saudi side, not the American side. So let me just begin with a couple of overall questions. We're going to have seven minute rounds, and uh, we'll have a second round if uh, we have time. Uh, let me ask each one of you, and I think it's a yes or no question. If this were a subpoena from the United States Department of Justice or the Securities and Exchange Commission, would your position be the same? Mr. Lesser, yes or no? Senator, we're caught between two sovereigns. No, I, it's a yes or a no. Laws. Would your position be the same? I think we would be taking legal counsel, as we have here, on what to do in a situation where there are two sovereigns that have put us in so an irreconcilable position. Your position would be the same. We would be taking counsel on how to handle the situation. We are caught between two sovereigns, and we are doing the best we can, including Mr. Sternfeld. Living. I don't mean to be rude, but I have limited time, Mr. Sternfeld. Thank you, Senator. Um, Yes, we uh, treat complying with all subpoenas under U.S. law incredibly seriously. It would be the same. Mr. Klein. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, in the same way as we are here today, we would intend to comply fully, and we would intend to cooperate, and we would uh, en endeavor to work through all legal ramifications. I'm going to take that as a yes, and Mr. Lesser, I'm going to take your response as a yes. It would be the same, Mr. Gary? Senator, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we will fully comply with the subpoena and any other subpoenas. So your position would be the same. Uh, let me ask each of you also a yes or no question. Uh, if we were talking about China, China issues some administrative court order, Beijing, saying you can't comply with a lawful subpoena from a United States Congressional Committee, would your position be the same, Mr. Lesser? Our position is that we have to follow the laws in which the countries, the countries in which we operate, and we're caught between two. So your position would be the same. You would comply only to the extent that the People's Republic of China, the PRC, would permit you to do so. I think we would be looking for court guidance on a situation like that. And American issue, court guidance? On an issue of international comedy, I believe Mr. so. Mr. Sternfeld? Senator, complying with the U.S. subpoena remains our highest priority while we continue to operate and abide by the laws of all the countries that we operate in. You know, I'm going to take that as a yes also, even though I don't regard it as directly responsive. Mr. Klein? Senator, thank you. Uh, we would intend, as we do here today, uh, to cooperate fully uh, and we would also uh, deal with, as we are today, expeditiously solving uh, any legal uh, constraint that we have. So you would accept the order of the Chinese court telling you not to comply with the American subpoena, Mr. Keary? Senator, I would, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we will fully comply with the subpoena of the PSI. All we have asked for and been given by your staff is some time to work through the legal complexity, but uh, PSI and the compliance with the subpoena is what we will do fully. You know, I think a lot of the American public are going to be asking me and our colleagues when we go home, what are they hiding? What are they concealing? If it were a Department of Justice subpoena or if it were a court order from China, their position would be the same. 
Is that a defensible position? Um, I want to ask uh, each of you, um, beginning with Mr. Lesser, what was your most recent amount of revenue in the last year from for the Saudi fund, Arabia for your consulting we, service? We don't disclose our, our revenues globally beyond our global revenues, uh, Senator, so I can't share that information. We're a private company. Uh, with great respect, sir. Do you, cal do you calculate? Do you have those numbers? Somebody probably does. I actually don't have that number, sir, and Senator. Mr. Sternfeld, what was the amount of revenue to McKinsey from Saudi Arabia in the last year? Thank you, Senator. We, um, uh, we operate in a regional model, so it's the Middle East, Africa, and Central Asia. Um, you, don't that break region, out, you don't break out revenue numbers we, for Saudi Arabia? We break out by the region. That region in total, um, I don't have the exact figure, but it's less than 10% of our total revenue, sir. Well, for the I'm interested region. in Saudi Arabia. I'd be happy to come back afterwards uh, on that. Mr. Klein. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we don't have that number here, but I'm happy to provide it for you. It was a very small number relative to the rest of our business, and we're happy to provide, You'll provide that, that number. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Curie. As Senator, as I mentioned earlier, our contracts and fees are filed under FARA. Um, I'll give you a sense of, in 2022, our fees uh, with PIF are just under $10 million. Um, let me ask um, you, uh, Mr. Curie, you have filed under FARA, the Foreign Agent Registration Act, correct? Correct, Senator. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Sternfels, McKinsey has not filed under FARA. Uh, I have the respective filings. I'll put them on the poster board. Um, for each of your companies, yours is totally blank. Teneo has filed under Farah, what's the justification for McKinsey not doing so? Thank you, Senator. I, um, I, I can't comment on the page and mention, but I can answer the question, uh, which as it relates to, to FARA, um, we take FARA incredibly seriously. Um, uh, we seek outside expert counsel uh, on anything that might be FARA related. Uh, we sought expert counsel in this case, and um, given there was no policy or influence in any kind, um, determined that this was not FARA uh, reportable. Well, let me just say to colleagues, uh, I think one of the findings that we're developing here is that FARA needs to be strengthened. And I'm not saying, Mr. Sternfels, that you're violating the law, but certainly if Teneo thought it had an obligation to file under FARA, I'm questioning why McKinsey didn't. I'm not saying that you're not doing so violates the law, but maybe the law should be strengthened so that there is a legal obligation under these circumstances that's clear and unmistakable. Um, you have said, all of you, that uh, you've produced thousands of documents, no question that you have, as recently as last night, literally. Uh, we haven't been through all of them, but we've been through some of them and uh, a lot of them are press clippings, they are press releases, they are public documents, uh, all sorts of stuff, and then a lot of them are, they look like this. That's not responsive to a subpoena. When you say you are making every effort to comply, <laughs> that's laughable. So, uh, you know, we will continue this conversation with you, but again, I come back to the basic question here. What are they hiding? Is that Saudi Arabia national security? Investments in Live Golf is a matter of national security to the kingdom? Hard to believe. Senator Johnson. So, so, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the fact you're holding up those redacted documents. Remind me an awful lot of the last 50 pages of Dr. Fauci's emails. Uh, Dr. Fauci's not a sovereign. 
He doesn't work for a size or a nation, he works for us. And yet HHS is delivering, that's their responsiveness to us in terms of that kind of redaction. So just try and make that point again. We'll be writing a, a strong request, hopefully with you signing on to uh, shake those loose from the agencies. Um, I'd like to go through and have each one of you witnesses describe exactly what your attorneys are telling you the legal jeopardy is uh, within Saudi Arabia for your employees that uh, work there. Start with you, Mr. Lesser. Thank you for that question, Senator. Um, there's been multiple litigation efforts going on and we've received uh, strong letters from, uh, from the, the PIF and from the Saudi court saying that our staff and our firm is criminally exposed if we were to share documents that they haven't approved. And so we have contested that litigation uh, multiple times to try to get permission to uh, produce as much as possible uh, in response to the subpoena. But we do feel at substantial risk criminally, not just for the firm, but for our, um, for our staff. And that's what our lawyers have advised us and we feel we have to take that incredibly seriously. So have, have they specifically <clears throat> pointed out specific employees who would be uh, found legally liable? I mean, would that be the, the top manager? Or would it be individuals that would literally go into the files and make file copies and, or any and all of the above? <clears throat> Senator, I, I genuinely don't know. I don't think specific individuals have been singled out, but, but the fact that individuals would be uh, at legal risk has been clearly stated to us. Uh, Mr. Sternfels. Well, thank you, Senator. Um, and I'd, I'd start with, um, I'm not a lawyer and I'm certainly not expert in, uh, in Saudi law, but I'll tell you what I understand. Um, uh, an injunction uh, has been filed by the PIF uh, against us. Uh, we're vigorously opposing that, uh, that injunction. Um, and from what I understand, the penalties for that injunction uh, are significant um, civil and criminal penalties. And, and we have 400 folks in, in Saudi, and, and that includes nine Americans. Would the Saudi citizens that work for you be under a higher level of legal scrutiny than, let's say, the American citizens? Would they be higher risk because they're Saudi citizens and potentially more subject to the court Again, dictates? Senator, I, I don't know. From what I understand, um, this has implications for potentially all of our folks. Mr. Klein, what, what are you aware of in terms of uh, what your legal counsel may be telling you in terms of the jeopardy of your employees in Saudi Arabia? Uh, ranking member, thank you. Uh, the PIF has expressed to our firm uh, and to others uh, what they believe is their right as a sovereign to go to court to preserve uh, their interests uh, and that they have uh, a right, not simply based upon the contracts that we have signed, but a right to certain protections under so sovereign law as Saudis. What the court order that we received uh, states is that if we are to provide either in a written form or in this forum uh, information that were to breach uh, the specific injunction, we could be held criminal, criminally liable. And that criminal liability, as I understand it, is as much as 20 years imprisonment as well as monetary fines. Uh, it is not defined as to which individuals. Uh, it is addressed directly to the firm. Mr. Curie, what, what, what does your counsel tell you? Uh, thank you, Senator. I think first point principle is I don't think we get there. I think we work through and fully satisfy the subcommittee in terms of the subpoena. Um, and there'll be an accelerated production of documents to show the good faith efforts are delivering the returns. Secondly, from a legal perspective, uh, U.S. counsel has shared it's just a very complex, almost unprecedented situation. Our Saudi counsel has suggested there's a range of potential uh, challenges, uh, but it is really hard to predict at this juncture, Senator. So when you ch go to court and challenge what the, I guess you're challenging the PIF, or are you actually challenging the Saudi government? What, I mean, again, you, you say you are fighting off these injunctions. Who are you fighting in this case? The Saudi government or the public in investment fund? Mr. Curie, I'll start with you. Um, not an expert on Saudi law, Senator. Um, my understanding is that it is a, against PIF. 
Mr. Klein. Senator, uh, thank you. Um, we have expressed to the PIF and to the court uh, our full intention to comply, and we have sought relief with which to comply fully with this subpoena. I, I Sorry, don't is this just basically in, res in response to the lawsuit they've initiated against you? It is a, both in You haven't initiated your own counter lawsuit. This is just responding to the court proceeding. Thank you, Senator. We have responded uh, with our own direct filing, both seeking specific document relief and seeking to end this litigation. Uh, so I can't who initiated the, the, the litigation against you? Was that the Saudi government or was that the PIF? As I understand it, Senator, uh, it is the PIF and they have invoked, again, as I understand it, without full expertise, certain of their laws regarding information that they have as a government. Mr. Sternfels, uh, the, the chairman put up a uh, graphic there talking about that uh, disclosure of this information may impact Saudi Arabian national security. Have they made that claim? Is there any justification for that claim as far as you're aware of? Have you pushed back against that? Uh, Senator, as, as I had said, um, we are objecting to the injunction. Uh, and uh, I actually can today talk about the work that we did do uh, uh, with the PIF as it relates to this matter, if that's of interest. Okay. Mr. Lesser, as my time is running out here, just kind of describe what you've done pushing back against this injunction. Sure, Senator. Uh, the PIF has sued us in Saudi court um, and been clear to us that if we were to share uh, unapproved information, we would be violating Saudi law. And we have litigated this matter in Saudi court, seeking permission uh, to be able to produce under this subpoena. And that litigation is ongoing, and we've, uh, it was delayed several times, and we're continuing to pursue that vigorously in order to be able to produce materials for you. So if I just may, uh, you're obviously producing some documents, and you've been producing documents even after this injunction has been uh, granted. Is it a, just a general type of injunction? Is it about specific information? I mean, what, what does the injunction cover? We'll start with you, Mr. Lester. We've asked to produce fully to comply with this subpoena, and only a portion of what we've asked to produce has been approved to produce, so the litigation is related to the remaining information that we would like to produce that we've been unable to do. So, so. so it's a general injunction and you're pushing back on kind of a case-by-case -case basis, can we produce this, can we produce that? Is that common with all, all four of you? Okay, I have no further questions, thanks. Senator Butler. Thank you, Chair Blumenthal, and thank you, um, gentlemen, for, for coming. I'd like to just, I genuinely have a couple of yes or no uh, questions and just some short answer ones. Um, Mr. Lesser, we'll, we can start with you and sort of work our way uh, down. How long has PIF been a client of yours, and are you still, are they still a client of, of yours? They are still a client. I know they were a client as of 2016, because that was one of the documents we complied with. I don't know if they were a client before 2016. Mr. Sternfels. Yeah, Senator, si similarly, I, um, they, they are still a client. I don't know exactly when we started uh, working with them. Senator, thank you for the question. The PIF remains a client of ours, and I believe our first engagement was in 2017. Senator, our engagements with PIF started in 2021, and they're still a client. Mr. Curie, let's work our way back the other way this time. Um, just again, I, th I think a legitimate um, or a really a yes or no, do you normally retain clients who sue you? It's a very unprecedented scenario, Senator. Mm. I agree. Mr. Klein? Uh, Senator, thank you for the... Very fair question. Uh, this represents uh, aberrant behavior for a client and, quite frankly, for the PIF, who has historically been uh, a client that has operated with best practices of governance with us. Um, no, Senator, it's not uh, common practice, but I would say that um, 
over even the last several weeks, we've made a lot of progress here uh, in continuing to get uh, this committee, uh, subcommittee, what it needs. And uh, I hope we're not done on that dimension. Mm -hmm. Senator, many aspects of this are unprecedented for us in this situation, and uh, I would also say that we've made some progress and we're continuing to do our best efforts to be able to make more progress. I, I got to say, I can't say that I'm surprised necessarily by the responses of, of any uh, of the corporations representing your companies represented here, but it does take me back to Senator Blumenthal's point. If um, you have a client, you've chosen to have a client in the PIF. Uh, they have displayed um, not normal, out of character behavior toward, and aggressive behavior towards you, threatened your company, your livelihood, the, se the security of your employees, and you remain in business with them sounds incredibly curious to me, and I, I again, associated myself with the comments of the chair, I wonder what is actually going on here, because I've not seen a U.S. business choose a foreign, any client, foreign or otherwise, that would behave so aggressively towards your overall uh, bottom line. Um, just a uh, last bucket of questions, Mr. Chair, if I, I could. Um, may, maybe they will go as, as quickly. Uh, Mr. Sternfield's really directed towards, uh, towards you. Um, I have some curiosity about your work, um, or not yours, McKinsey's uh, work uh, on a project, I think, Nayum, uh, self-described futuristic city in northwestern Saudi Arabia. Are you familiar with that? Uh, I'm, I'm not, Senator, uh, but if it's of interest, I'm happy to, to come back after. What is of interest are the human rights violations targeted towards an uh, indigenous community or uh, higher white tribe, um, the displacement of 20,000 uh, individuals and the reported death sentence by the Saudi Arabian government of three tribe members who resisted displacement. I am uh, of, I'm concerned about well, I am. I want to know how that ty those type of human rights violations, uh, as alleged, rest with the um, uh, sync with the intentions uh, and vision of of McKinsey, and uh, again, sort of how you can choose uh, to retain a client who has been who may not share your value set and has been aggressive towards your overall business bottom line. And I would love to have a follow-up uh, with you specifically on, on those alleged violations. That is, those are all my questions, Chair. Thanks, Senator Butler. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for calling this hearing. Thanks to the witnesses for being here. Mr. Sternfels, if I could just start with you. Did I hear you say in your opening statement I'm going to quote you now. We have the industry's most rigorous client selection policy. Did I get that right? We believe that to be true, Senator. Well, how is it then that you end up with so many clients who are state-owned Chinese corporations hostile to the United States? Uh, thank you, Senator. So the basis for my uh, answer was we've invested over $700 million over the last several years um, to put in place a rigorous client selection process that looks at a whole series of factors. Um, well, let's, let's talk about some of your clients. Like the China Communications Construction Company, this is a firm that is blacklisted by the United States government. This is a state-owned enterprise that is responsible for building artificial islands in the South China Sea, probably in direct contravention of international law, certainly in direct contravention to United States security interests. You help them develop their five-year plan. Why is that a good idea? Senator, our work in China uh, overwhelmingly works with uh, multinational companies, including many of those being U.S. Uh, and private sector No, actually, Chinese you've companies. advised 22 of the 100 biggest state-owned companies in, in China. That's according to the New York Times. Let's talk about another one, the, the Chinese Ocean Shipping Company. That's a state-owned conglomerate that's played a key role in China's naval expansion. I'm quoting from NBC News here and Beijing's bid to extend its global reach. This company has been given special status by the CCP 
and forms the core of China's defense industrial base. This company has provided logistical support to the Chinese Navy's escort operations in the Gulf of Aden, and experts say, I'm still quoting, it serves as the maritime logistical arm for the People's Liberation Army. You're advising them. How much money did you make on that contract? Uh, no, Senator. We're not advising them. Neither. Did you ever advise them? Historically, we advised on none of the topics that um, you had highlighted. You, d you didn't advise the Chinese Ocean Shipping Company? Not on the topics you described, Senator. Why is it a good idea to advise them at all? They're a state-owned enterprise engaged in activity directly contrary to the security interests of this nation. And they're no longer a client of ours, sir. Why did you advise on 22 of the 100 biggest Chinese state-owned enterprises? That number I don't believe is accurate, Senator. It doesn't have anything to do with money, does it? I don't believe that number's accurate, Senator. How much money do you make off the United States government? I don't know the size of our work with the U.S. I uh, do. government, Senator. In 2021, you made more than $850 million in consulting work for the federal government with the Department of Defense as your top client. When you bid for those government contracts, did you disclose your work for these Chinese state-owned enterprises that were conducting activity adverse to our national security? Did you disclose it to the Department of Defense? Senator, we take uh, OCI incredibly seriously and have even gone beyond what is required around disclosures. So that's um, a yes? We take it incredibly seriously. We made all appropriate disclosures, Senator. Uh, I'm happy to come back to you on any, any details uh, specific to the work that we do on the Department of Defense. That's, that's not what, that is not what news reports have found and news agencies who've looked into this. In fact, to quote NBC News again, and bidding on contracts with the Department of Defense, the U.S. Navy, Customs and Border Protection, you did not disclose your work with Chinese enterprises and apparent conflict of interest. A report in 2021 showed, December 2021, that you admitted to providing services only for provincial and local governments in China, but not for the central government in China. My question is, why should you be able to get any contracts in the United States government? If you're going to advise foreign nations who are hostile to us and make gobs of money off of them, why should you be getting U.S. government contracts? Senator, we've never worked with the Chinese Communist Party or the central government in China, to the best of my knowledge. You're working with state-owned enterprises. This is, this is, China's not a democracy. They own these companies. These companies are doing the bidding of the Chinese military, and you're making money off of it, hand over fist. My question is, I guess if you want to do that, I, I guess it doesn't violate the law. But I just wonder, why is it that you should then be able to turn around and make $850 million in one year alone off the American taxpayer? I mean, explain that to me. Senator, um, our work with the federal government, uh, we stand behind. Uh, we bring- Well, I'm sure you do. It's incredibly lucrative. <laughs> That's the problem. You make gobs of money off of our enemies, and then you turn around and you make gobs of money off of us. It's outrageous, frankly. Listen, you shouldn't be doing any work with the Chinese Communist Party and any enterprise that they own or have, have some share in. You shouldn't. And if you were serious about ethics, you wouldn't be doing it. But it's particularly outrageous that you then make money, almost a billion dollars in a year, off the United States government, including the Defense Department. Now, I, am go I have introduced a law that would prohibit you from doing just this, and I will continue to push it until we get a vote on it. Now, let me ask you about one of the things, since I've got you here, and I have to tell you, since I'm, I represent the state of Missouri that has been absolutely devastated by the opioid crisis, and I know you know a lot about that, because speaking of money, McKenzie has made an unbelievable amount of money off of the opioid crisis. Let me ask you about this New York Times report, which found that McKenzie proposed paying a $14,810 bounty to pharmacies for each opioid overdose. Is McKenzie proud of that work? Senator, uh, our work was designed to actually reduce Opioid abuse? Really? Let me ask you about this. I think we've got a poster of this. We sell hope in a bottle. This is an advertising campaign you came up with. We sell hope in a bottle. That's for opioids. Hope in a bottle. You help Purdue Pharma market them to children. The Massachusetts Attorney General has filed a lawsuit that has all of these disclosures in it describing how McKinsey consultants recommended and pushed Purdue to turbocharge OxyContin sales. McKinsey urged the Sacklers, owners of Purdue, to make a clear go, no-go decision to turbocharge the sales engine. The consultants pushed the board of directors to turbocharge the sales engine, to drive up the sale of opioids that is killing people left and right. 
Is McKenzie proud of that work? Senator, as I had stated in the House, um, we, uh, we, saw, we were too slow in seeing the epidemic unfold around us. You helped uh, cause the epidemic. Our, no, Senator. Uh, really? You don't think that helped cause the epidemic? You don't think marketing these drugs to doctors and children helped cause the epidemic? You don't think you have any part in that? Senator, what I can say, including the state of Massachusetts, is we were the first to actually reach a settlement with all, all states. Well, sure. I mean, <laughs> sure. When you're over a barrel, <laughs> what are you doing for victims right now? Senator, we've reached agreement with the states and municipalities. Have you set up a compensation fund? Are you sharing some of your profits with them? Senator, the, the settlement details are public. Well, I'm, I'm asking you. I mean, have you, have you set up a compensation fund? Share some of your prodigious profits with the victims who Senator, our whose lives you help destroy. Our substantial settlements go to exactly that cause. You know, I've sat here and I've listened to your responses to my colleagues, and it's, it's the same old thing over and over. You don't want to be accountable for anything that you do. But I tell you what, this is unforgettable and, frankly, unforgivable. And your work right now, taking money from this government as you help the Chinese Communist Party is absolutely unforgivable, and I will not rest until it is illegal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Hawley. Senator Hassan. Well, I want to thank you, Chairman Blumenthal and Ranking Member Johnson, for holding the hearing and for leading this inquiry into the efforts of the Saudi Arabian Crown Prince to influence U.S. policy and uh, the impacts that it has on our national security. Um, I want to just note for the record uh, that, as uh, Mr. Sternfels well knows, uh, that I join Senator Hawley in my concern about McKinsey's role in the opioid epidemic. Uh, we have passed some legislation that needs to be fully implemented to require more transparency in similar situations. Uh, but let's turn to the issue at hand today. Congress has a really well-established right to compel documents and testimony, including from United States companies. And I just want to be clear for the public here, the Supreme Court of the United States has held that our Constitution prohibits United States judicial interference with the issuance of congressional subpoenas. So a court in this country can't interfere with congressional subpoenas. So I would just, yes or no down the line, I just want to make sure we have this on the record. Is it true that your companies refuse to comply with this committee's subpoena, citing an injunction from a Saudi Arabian administrative court, a court that is notoriously not independent and under the direct influence of the Saudi regime? So please, yes or no, we'll start with you, Mr. Lesser. Senator, we've complied to the extent that we can given the situation that we're placed in. So that is a yes, you are taking the Saudi Arabian's court's direction over this congressional direction, Mr. Sternfels. Senator, we're, we believe we're in the process of complying with the subpoena in this subcommittee and we'll continue to do so. But you are still uh, letting the Saudi Arabian court uh, govern how you are complying, if you are complying. Mr. Klein. Senator, thank you for the question. We are complying. We intend to comply fully, uh, and we intend to continue to press uh, all avenues to ensure our full compliance. So that means, I just want to be clear here, if you aren't successful with the Saudi Arabian courts, you're going to fully comply and just um, decide that uh, the United States Congress has authority over a United States company and that you're going to follow our law. If the Saudi Arabian court doesn't go your way, you're going to still follow the law here and fully comply. We are entirely hopeful that we will resolve all aspects of the legal issues in Saudi Arabia, and we have intended to comply with this U.S. subpoena from the beginning, and we intend to comply going forward. I will take that as a you will uh, continue to allow the Saudi Arabian Administrative Court to uh, govern your response. And Mr. Kiri. Senator, we will fully comply with the subcommittee subpoena. And we'll take the, we're accelerating that process uh, every day, but we will fully comply with the subcommittee subpoena. Regardless of what the Saudi Arabian courts we will, we decide. Will fully, we will fully comply, Senator. Okay, just let me be clear for those who didn't give the last answer. By refusing to respond to this committee's subpoena and 
request for a legal justification for your refusal, your firms appear to have placed your loyalties to Saudi Arabia above your loyalty to the United States of America, our national security, and the principles of transparency. Uh, I also heard your discussion about the risk assessments you do before you decide to take on a particular client. And one of the things a good legal department does in a massive company with lots of resources is that they look at the law of the jurisdiction that you want to do business in, and if it says uh, that they might give you trouble with complying with the United States subpoena from this Congress, you might decide not to do business there because that's a high risk. And the fact that you decided anyway seems to me to say that you don't take the authority of this Congress very seriously. So now to Mr. Sternfels and Mr. Lesser. Both McKinsey and Boston Consulting Group do work in China, which, like Saudi Arabia, does not have an independent judiciary. I am concerned that if Congress were to subpoena information from McKinsey or BCG or its work in China or on behalf of the Chinese government, that a Chinese court could also try to block compliance with that subpoena. So to the two of you, if a Chinese court blocked compliance with a congressional subpoena, would you refuse to respond to the subpoena? Mr. Lesser, yes or no? Senator, we're doing everything we can to reply to the subpoena as fully as we can and specific to China. We have very clear guidelines in of the kind of work we do and don't do. So Just if a Chinese court careful. tried to block your compliance with the subpoena, you would ignore the Chinese court or do your best to get them to change their mind, but ultimately you would comply with the subpoena from this Congress regardless of what the position of the Chinese government is. Senator, we do our best to comply in every situation and follow the laws of all the countries in which we work. That is, that is what we have tried to do here, and we, we are incredibly respectful of this subcommittee and its subpoena, and we are continuing to work to be able to fully meet your request. So let me ask Mr. Sternfels again. The Chinese government tells you you may not comply with the subpoena from the United States Congress. What are you going to do? Thank you, Senator. And I'd um, start uh, with the, um, reaffirming we don't work uh, with the federal government in, uh, in China. We have very tight client selection policies. Right. I, I'm um, going to stop you just because my time is limited. Um, the Chinese government runs the businesses in China. So let's just be very clear about the, the line you're trying to draw just isn't there. So now, uh, again, my time is limited, and I have one more question for you, Mr. Sternfeld. So um, will you cooperate with an investigation with a subpoena from Congress, even if the Chinese government says no? Absolutely, Senator. Cooperating with this, um, with this Senate is uh, our highest priority, and we will continue to do so. Well, if that is true, then you need to respond fully to this committee's subpoena. Um, because right now, what we see is a refusal to cooperate with this investigation, and that sets a really dangerous precedent, um, which again leads me, my colleagues, and the American public to question uh, the loyalties of your company. Now, I have one more quick question, if I could, uh, and it really is just a follow-on to Senator Hawley. Um, I've led oversight and legislative efforts to bring greater transparency to conflicts of interest from groups like McKinsey in the wake of your failure to disclose your work for opioid producers while simultaneously advising the Food and Drug Administration on opioid regulations. Once again, here, McKenzie is failing to tr be transparent in its work, and in this case, it has significant implications for our national security. You talked with Senator Hawley about uh, your receipts from government contracts. Um, I know that in fiscal year 2023, uh, you had tens of millions of dollars uh, of um, proceeds from our defense industry for, and from national security agencies such as the U.S. Department of Defense. So I have to tell you that I am deeply skeptical that McKinsey's work is compatible with United States national security interests, especially given that your work has been linked to alleged human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia and supporting a Chinese state-owned enterprise that constructs military installments in the South China Sea. Uh, at the end of the day, what the American people want to know is whether American companies will put American national interests before anyone else's. And 
the reason you are all here today is because your response to these subpoenas seems to really call that into question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Senator Hassan. Just to follow up on a couple of the questions that Senator Hassan asked, uh, let me just make clear, you answered the question about China when I asked it, essentially saying your position would be the same. And I think that answer is essentially the same as you gave to Senator Hassan, because doing your best, as you put it, Mr. Lesser, or cooperating, as you put it, Mr. Sternfeld, is not complying with the subpoena. I hate to talk here like a lawyer, but these distinctions really make a difference. And we will potentially see in court how much of a difference they make. And the fact that your position would be the same in response to a Department of Justice subpoena or an SEC subpoena simply shows the consequence, really the magnitude of the issue that concerns us here. And I recognize and I sympathize with your concern for your employees and I am concerned also. And I just have to ask uh, each of you don't you have second thoughts about doing business with a client, a country, that says it's going to throw your employees in jail for obeying American law? Mr. Lesser. Senator, um, this whole experience, going back six months now, has been unprecedented for us, and as we understand from our lawyers, an unprecedented disagreement where a Senate subpoena is in direct conflict with the laws of another country that views the information to be confidential. We are all navigating uncharted waters here and we are doing it in the spirit of being as compliant as possible and I'm still hopeful that we will get to a resolution that will work to meet your needs and respect the laws there so that we're not, uh, so that we can move forward in a positive way and that's the spirit that we've operated in since the beginning, but it is unprecedented, and when this whole experience is over, of course we'll look at what we've learned from it and how we can avoid a similar situation in the future. But it has been an extraordinarily difficult one for our entire team to navigate, and we think quite unprecedented in, in the history of the relationship of Senate subpoenas and the laws of other countries. Mr. Sternfeld. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we remain optimistic that um, we can avoid uh, any of the outcomes that you talk about. But I don't you have second thoughts about doing business with a country that says not just, oh, well, we'll try to arbitrate our differences, we'll try to settle our differences in court. No, it's our way or we put your people in prison. Doesn't that give you some qualms? Senator, I remain hopeful that we don't get to that scenario, that we can keep but working. that's what they've told you, correct? Senator, we've faced an injunction, uh, and the injunction has potential penalties. No one has, has said that. We look at the, the injunction. We're hopeful we can avoid that. And I do come back to my commitment that I made to you personally and the entire subcommittee that we will continue to comply with the subpoena. We don't think we're done here. And uh, we will continue to advance both in, in um, submission of materials and reduction in those redactions that you pointed out. Mr. Klein. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I, I agree with you. This is extraordinarily troubling, uh, troubling for us and unprecedented, and it does give great pause for thought. We have uh, a responsibility as a transactional advisor to complete the work we've done for commitments we've made. In addition, we look very carefully at the actions of the PIF over the length of our relationship. And as I indicated, and will continue to indicate, this is an aberrant situation. Our work has been best practices, best governance, strong data-driven investment historically. We have been presented with 
a statement by the PIF that they believe they have certain sovereign rights uh, that are limiting their ability and has put them in this position of this particular court case. But it is intensely troubling, and we share your concern. Mr. Kerry. Senator, our work is filed under far rights, transparent. I'm very confident that we will have satisfied the, the subcommittee in, in full compliance. And um, I just don't think we get there, Senator, in terms of those consequences. Well, I, I can tell you, you know, um, I've been a prosecutor, I've been a private lawyer. I'm not sure I would work for a client that said to me, you comply with American law and we'll throw you in prison for work done on an American investment in America under American law with the protections of rights that America guarantees. Um, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Sternfels, we know that uh, McKinsey advised the PIF on Project Wedge before the launch of Live Golf. What is Project Wedge? Well, thank you, Senator. <clears throat> the, uh, you are correct. Um, we advised the PIF on Project Wedge. Um, this was work conducted in 2021, uh, and it was about six months worth of work. There were two phases to this. It focused on uh, the economic viability of standing up a new golf league. Right? This was before the creation of, of LIV. It was before any discussions between uh, the PGA and LIV. Um, but the question that we were asked is, um, could a new golf league be economically viable? And we conducted a uh, business case analysis uh, around those set of questions, Senator. Uh, you also worked on the Lucid Motor deal? I'm not uh, familiar with that, Senator. Aside from Project Wedge and Live Golf and Lucid, what other deals have you worked on with this? Senator, as um, uh, I had mentioned in my uh, opening statement, um, the vast majority of work that we do with the PIF relates to investments in Saudi Arabia. We conducted a thorough research to find any work that we've done that would have any intersection with the United States, and we found three. They related to uh, the topics of carbon credits, carbon capture, and healthcare. And to the best of my knowledge, Senator, none yielded any investment in the United States. Well, let me ask you, uh, did any of those projects, including Project Wedge, involve Saudi Arabian national security? In terms of what we were asked, Senator, not to my knowledge, we were focused on a business case analysis, sir. Did your work for Saudi Arabia or PIF uh, regarding uh, the PGA Tour or Live Golf involve national security? Senator, um, as I had stated, our work did not involve Live Golf or the PGA Tour. We were involved well before the creation. It was focused on agnostically, could a new golf league be economically viable? Uh, Mr. Lesser, has any of your work involved Saudi Arabian national security? Senator, from the standpoint of our look at our work, as we described, this was normal BCG work that we would do for an asset owner, a sovereign wealth fund. Um, but it so, didn't involve but, so, national but, security, did it? I mean, uh, weapon systems or troop no, movements or no, no, classified no, information? No, Senator, that was not the nature of our work. Mr. Klein, any of your work involved national security? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we serve as investment bankers. We have not uh, done any work on national security issues. Mr. Keary? Senator, no, none of our work involves issues of national security. Um, I have a final set of questions. Uh, I noticed that Senator Marshall has returned. Do you want to ask your question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My uh, first question is for Mr. Cernfels. Mr. Cernfels, it's my understanding that McKinsey has a significant relationship with the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese military, that you do significant work for them. What assurances can McKinsey give to this committee that McKinsey is committed to America and not the China Communist Party? Senator, we do no work, and to the best of my knowledge, never have 
for the Chinese Communist Party or for the central government in China. The vast majority of work that we do in China is for multinational companies. Many of those are U.S. companies and private sector uh, Chinese companies. None of these companies are owned or subsidiaries or partially owned by the CCP. Not to my knowledge, Senator. Will all the uh, witnesses commit to give your list of Chinese cli clients to your U.S. government clients? Mr. Lesser. Senator, my understanding is the most recent uh, legislation of the National Defense Authorization Act sets very clear guidelines of, of what it means to be compliant and to ensure that all the work we've done is done in the most secure way and all information that needs to be shared is shared and we will be completely compliant with those regulations as they're established. Okay. Mr. Certainfields, will you disclose your list of Chinese clients to your U.S. government clients? Thank you, Senator. Um, uh, we go well beyond the OCI requirements in terms of disclosure, uh, and I'm happy to share that with you uh, afterwards uh, in, in quite a bit of detail. Okay. Mr. Klein. Senator Marshall, yes. Thank you. Mr. Kerry. Senator, yes, we don't work with any U.S. government entities, but yes, in the event we had to, yes. Okay. I'm going to come back um, to, to Mr. Stearnsville. So you're saying that you, you do do work with the DOD, correct? The Department of Defense? Senator, we do work with the Department of Defense. But you're not, you don't do any work with, with Chinese-owned companies? Senator, we do no work with the Chinese Communist Party or the uh, central government in China. Or Chinese-owned companies? The vast majority of our work, um, Senator, in China is with multinational companies, many of those U.S., private sector, Chinese institutions. So I assume some of those have Chinese ownership, and certainly as I understand the CCP, it's, it's a very complex web. So as American taxpayers are, are spending money on DOD and they in turn are hiring you to do work, how do you make sure that, that none of those Chinese-owned companies are infiltrating or stealing uh, any of your intellectual property or, or spying on our military? Appreciate the question, Senator, and, and, and uh, as, uh, as a son of a vet who spent four years in Subic Bay when my dad served in the Navy and both grandparents were vets, um, and uh, taking national security in the U.S. is incredibly important to me, sir. It's incredibly important. We have stood up a dedicated capability in working with the Department of Defense that we've collaboratively built with the DOD, both around dedicated um, information technology infrastructure, around how we staff and how we treat information um, that the DOD has vetted and approved. And, and if that's interesting, Senator, I, I can take you, take you through that in detail. Have, have you noticed any um, cyber attacks on, on those systems and where do those cyber attacks come from? Senator, I, I can't give you the details on that. I can tell you that, as you well know, cyber attacks happen all the time. Um, we remain vigilant on this. We continue to invest um, significantly. Uh, to do our best to, uh, to defend. And we have worked collaboratively with the Department of Defense on our IT architecture um, to seek their approval for how we've actually set things up. I yield, thank you. Thanks, Senator Marshall. Uh, I have a couple more questions, but Senator Johnson, if you have others. Okay, yeah, just, just Senator Blumenthal uh, displayed some documents received. They were heavily redacted, I think, probably from McKinsey. I've got some from McKinsey as well. Uh, I'll first start with you. Who made those redactions? Sorry, I didn't know if you were asking me, Senator. Um, but we did not make those redactions. Uh, we've been working with the PIF to reduce those redactions. Those redactions were done by the, by the PIF. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lesser, if you provided documents, were there any redactions in them? Yes, we did provide documents, and yes, there were redactions. I believe we may have redacted some personally sensitive information like names, but all the other redactions, to the best of my understanding, uh, came from, from the PIF, not from BCG. Okay. Mr. Klein, thank did you. Did you supply documents that were redacted? Uh, Senator, thank you. 
the sole redactions that we provided were cell phone numbers. So no, no other redactions made by the PIF? No, any redactions made on any document that was delivered would have been made by the PIF or other members of their review process. Uh, our firm submitted documents that were complete with the exception of personal cell phone numbers. Okay. Uh, Mr. Keery. Senator, no redactions provided by Teneo, and I believe no redactions in the documents provided by, directly by the PIF. Okay. Uh, I guess the only other point I want to make is uh, I'm actually heartened by the fact that the chairman, uh, other Democrat colleagues are talking about how important it is to, to comply with congressional oversight and provide documents either under subpoena, I would say just under uh, you know, requests. I think the chairman mentioned twice it was staggering that we don't have full compliance in a pretty unprecedented situation here. I know Senator Hassan said that uh, not getting this information would set a very dangerous precedent. So again, I'm, I'm heartened by the fact that my Democrat colleagues are taking oversight and the committee's uh, constitutional authority to demand these documents. Uh, personally, I think it's even more staggering and even more dangerous precedent that our own federal health agencies uh, again, refused to turn over the last 50 pages of Dr. Fauci's emails. Those are heavily redacted. And uh, you know, we just can't get the analysis the, of, of their own VAER system. So again, I, I know I'm you know, making the point again, but we, we really do need to uh, step up the plate, demand that those uh, uh, documents are provided to us. And if they don't do it uh, with a strongly worded letter, I hope we follow up with a strongly <laughs> enforced subpoena. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Johnson. Mr. Curie, uh, Teneo made no redactions because what you produced was 837 pages of emails that contained nothing but news clippings. So there were essentially nothing to redact. It's all public. Mr. Klein, uh, your production, uh, half of it was public tax returns which are available publicly and then there were redactions of the other records, 925 pages of publicly available PGA tour tax returns um, was part of your production. I held up the McKinsey documents which consisted of blank pages, but Mr. Lesser, um, an example of your production 40 pages of calendar invitations. I have them here in front of me. You're familiar with them. Every one of those calendar invitations redacts the names of all the meeting attendees. Not really useful. So uh, I could go on. In the interest of time, I won't. But um, I would not call that compliance or cooperation. And um, let me just finish with a round of question, which uh, I think follows up on the point I made about uh, qualms of doing business in, about doing business in Saudi Arabia. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Sternfels, uh, one of your past engagement for the Saudi government, and I would have hoped that you'd identified it was to conduct research to identify so-called major influencers who had been critical of the Saudi government on social media. Is that correct? Senator, no. We did no such work for the Saudi government. Well, let me just show you a slide um, which identifies a number of individuals. I'm sure you've seen the slide because it comes from um, McKinsey, one of those individuals, Omar Abdul Aziz, uh, who was a friend of Jamal Khashoggi, alleged that his family members were not only arrested but tortured by the Saudi government after McKinsey helped to identify him. Of the other two individuals on this page, Khalid al Alkami was arrested and a third, Ahmad, <laughs> who had been anonymous, disappeared from the internet after being identified by McKinsey. Mr. 
Abdul Aziz managed to avoid arrest himself only because he was in Canada. Uh, you're saying that this slide does not reflect work that you did in any respect or any form for the Saudi government? Absolutely, Senator. This is no work that we did for the Saudi government. Uh, this was work that was done for internal purposes. Uh, we conducted a thorough investigation and found that there was no evidence of misuse. This material never left McKinsey. And respect to the individual in question, both lawsuits that he brought against us were dismissed in U.S. court, sir. Why did you do this kind of slide and perhaps other material? identifying dissidents in Saudi Arabia. Senator, I, I can't comment to why it was created. What I can comment is that it never left McKinsey. Um, did you do that kind of work with respect to dissidents in other countries? Senator, I can't comment on the work that we've done. That is not a type of work that we do. Have you ever done that work in China? Not to my knowledge, sir. Well, uh, let me just say, uh, in, in closing, um, we appreciate your being here. Um, as I said at the beginning of this hearing, the ramifications for this proceeding have potential to echo far outside this chamber, whatever happens next, the course of the federal government's oversight of United States companies in their dealings with foreign governments and foreign investors simply cannot and should not be dictated by a foreign power. We've heard a lot today about consultants before us feeling caught in the middle and having no choice but to bend to the will of a bully. Uh, we don't take unlightly the unprecedented and aggressive stance that the PIF has taken. The PIF is an arm of the Saudi kingdom, of the Saudi government, of the Saudi ministry, and you have an obligation to follow United States law. Contracting with a foreign government or entity does not eliminate that responsibility in my respectful view. I'd like each of the companies that are before us today to commit to appear before this panel again should we have additional questions about your compliance or the information you've provided? Do all of you commit to be here again? Yes, Senator. Yes, Senator. Senator, yes, we will. Yes, Senator. Thank you. Um, I, again, want to thank the ranking member for his partnership and support as we seek to uphold one of the bedrock principles of the Congress, which is our constitutional duty to conduct rigorous oversight and fact-finding, fact-based investigation. I want to commit to him again that we will work together on other investigations uh, that you have expressed interest in following through on. And uh, this subcommittee will consider the testimony heard today and the formal legal objections that you've filed, uh, that each of the consultants have filed. This record will remain open for 15 days for any additional comments or questions by any subcommittee member. And uh, with that, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you very much.